Good morning and welcome to the Enterprise Community Church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You know, you guys are getting good at that. It sounds good. And it is a day of rejoicing. I want to announce a couple things today. Don't forget, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, we're going to have the hobo stew out there at the Gesky Lake. All right? There'll be a time, a good time of sharing and fun and good bills, too. So be sure to mark that down and try to get out there and visit, visit with us out there. Now, there's one other thing that's real important. Next week is the time change, which means you're supposed to fall back in the, in the fall. Now, if you forget and you decide, well, I'm just going to, I'm out here, now what do I do? You go ahead and come on in and join us, because that just means you get to go to Sunday school. That isn't bad. So, if you forget and get here early, just come on in. We're here, they'll be here to welcome you. Um, do note that on the 13th, we have a, a person who's a pastoral candidate going to be preaching that Sunday. So, be here, hear what he has to say, and then plan to stay afterwards for some conversation time with some cookies and just to, to meet him a little bit to see whether you as a congregation feel like he's a good fit or not. So that's on the 13th. Gene and I are going to hide. We're not going to be here that day because I don't want him feeling like I'm sitting there judging him as an as existing pastor. And so just... Do this proud, all right? Show him that how many of you will come and, and, and see what he has to say. Um, that's the, well, we have meetings coming up, but that stuff, you can all read that yourself. Is there anything else you would like me to bring up this morning for the, the church family? This is the last day of the, for uh, donations to the food pantry, which we're going to bless them here in a little bit. That we have just a sampling of them here, but uh, those will be headed off toward uh, the pantry to be used for the, the people that need it in the community afterwards. All right, then, in that case, would you bow your heads for an opening prayer? Lord, we come this morning seeking to abide in your presence. Open our minds to your spirit of wisdom, that we may know how to live as your people. Open our hearts to your spirit of truth, that we may love our neighbors with the love that speaks of your love and radical grace. May this time of worship be authentic and pleasing in your sight, O Lord. Amen. The first hymn of this morning is number... 2108 in your faith we sing, which is your black one. And Psalm 57 9 says, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. So join as you're able. I mean, stand as you're able and join in singing.
Morgan James. Oh, oh, yes. Yes. Morgan James. Whoa. God is good. Thank you all. Stay standing for the call to worship. Say she directs you just like she directs me. <laughs> I guide, I don't direct. Oh, okay, she guides. <laughs>
It's time now when we share our joys and our concerns to not just to voice them, but to actually place them before God for a time when He can deal with them for us and help us deal with what we need to deal with. So I ask now, we have a few things that are just our normal things listed in our, our bulletin. If you note those things. Are there any other things that you would like to add to that list of things to be prayed for that are your story to tell or that you have permission to tell? In that case, can you bow your heads for a word of prayer? El Shaddai, God Almighty, blessed are you, Creator of all. To you be praised and glory forever. As the dawn you give renews the face of the earth, bringing light and life to all creation, may we rejoice in this day that you have made. As we awake refreshed from the depths and sleep, open our eyes to an awareness of your, the beauty and order that this world you created has. And Lord, give us the understanding to see your hand in all of that. God, we know that you are continually present with us, watching and guiding our steps. When we falter, you pick us up, you dust us off, and you place us back on the path. When we run in directions that are harmful, you are ready to rescue and redeem us. When we shout our disbelief, you offer us your love and are ready to receive us. Because we know you love us. We also at this time bring before you prayers that we have for the, the person who hurts and mourns this morning. And also to that person that celebrates. Not just the person that hurts, but also that one who did the hurting. We pray for the distress of the person who is searching and also for the joy of the one who finds you. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much for new life, the joy that that brings. God, give us a heart for people in our community to share with them the love that you have shared with us. Today, as we have gathered, remembering all those who have gone before us, who have paved the way of our faith. We give you thanks, God, for their witness and the heritage of faithfulness they passed on. They left their mark on the earth for you, for us, and for our children to come. And we pray that you would strengthen us, that we may also be found faithful by those who come after us. Help us to be aware that we stand in the same long line of witnesses to your love that they are part of. Give us courage and strength to submit ourselves to your work in our lives as you conform us to your image. Remind us again that you are not looking for us to be perfect before we come to you, for you will take our rough edges and make them smooth. You will find that sparkling gem in the rough stone. Let us place our trust in our lives and your loving care that that gem can be seen. Help us to devote ourselves and all that we do to your glory, Lord. And Father, we offer these prayers in the precious name of Jesus, who was and is and ever will be the only Savior of the world and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The praise hymn this morning is nothing but the blood of Jesus 
hymn number 362 in your red hymnals, and you may remain seated. It's time now when we do offer a prayer up for the tithes and offerings that we have placed in the plate at the back. And I ask that you would bow your heads with for a moment for that prayer as well. Oh God, you bless us in so many areas of our lives, in places we often fail to even recognize as a blessing. Help us to have eyes to see and hearts to understand the depth of your love and blessing for us. Today, we give out of that blessings, dedicating ourselves and these offerings to your mission of reaching the lost 
with the message of the cross. And amen. Marilyn, what do we have for, for Marilyn's choice? Let's see. Page 514, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Number 514 in your red handles, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Now, I'm going to say this. Normally, we don't have you stand up for Marilyn's choice, but it seems like that really ought to happen this time. So, would you stand as you're able and try to sing? Starting in verse 18 from the English Standard Version. 
For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. <clears throat> Father, as I give this message, I again ask that you would put me aside. And let the folks here hear what is a message from you, that they might take it to heart as you would have them take it to heart. For it is in your son's name I pray this. Amen. <clears throat> There's a movie that's called Nim's Island that Gene and I have on DVD and enjoy watching occasionally. I don't know whether any of you have ever heard of it. It was never a, a big movie. Oh, you have. Good. That way you'll at least know what I'm talking about here. When we first watched it in the theater over in Salinas several years ago, it was because we actually, the movie we went there to see was sold out. It was a movie about how the people who believed in Jesus were getting fired from colleges. And we would have gone over to Salinas to see that, and it was sold out. But we'd already drove all over there already and met with a friend that we were going to enjoy that movie with. So we decided, well, we'll just pick another movie. And there was this movie called Mims Island, and we decided we'd watch it. Now, the storyline of that movie is that Nim, which is played by Abigail Bretzman, lives on a remote island with her father, who's played by Gerard Butler. Now, she's about 11 years old, and he is a, micro, a marine microbiologist, if you can imagine such a thing. She's making fun of him about he's more interested in what's in a, under a slide than what's in the whole world around him. But she spends her time having adventures with all these wild animals that are her friends there on the island and gaining her education with, through books and using them her imagination. And she also reads adventure books about an adventurer called Alex Rover that's written according to the spine of the book by Alex Rover. Now, there's a time in there when her father disappears to sea, and she's alone on the island and gets injured. So she texts Alex Rover for help. Now, the problem is that she doesn't know that Alex Rover is actually Alexandra Rover, who is played by Jodie Foster. <coughs> she's that, that this Alexandra is a recluse who suffers from agoraphobia, which is the extreme and irrational fear of entering into closed or open spaces, or even fear of leaving your home. Now, the movie hilariously chronicles how they finally get together toward the end of the movie. But early in that movie, Jodie Foster's character is struggling with a new 
adventure book that she's writing. And she's reading an article from National Geographic that's written by Ben's father. As, and as, she, as, she's referred, as she is trying to research information on volcanoes for that book. And the title of the article that she's reading is Living in the Shadow of a Volcano. And when she reads that, she just stops and she responds like this. Says, well, that's just crazy. Well, I mean, why would anyone want to do that? As an agoraphobic, she simply couldn't identify with such a thing. To her, it was the height of foolishness. And I have to wonder if in God's eyes we aren't all agoraphobic people, afraid of everything, who then let our irrational fears color our whole outlook and color the way we live our lives, blinding us to the truth that he has revealed to us in the life and resurrection, death and resurrection of his son, Jesus, who is our Christ. He must sometimes want to just throw his hands up in the air, metaphorically speaking, because he doesn't have any, in despair over our thick-headedness. The truth is that sometimes what seems the most foolish and foolish is the only right way to go. When I was in the Air Force flying as a crew member on AC-135, we had to learn to use the parachute that was part of the seat that we all sat in. We each all had our own parachute. And we had to prepare for the possibility that we might have to jump out of the aircraft. We used to joke about that. I mean, we'd say things like, why in the world would anyone want to jump out of a perfectly good jet when it's flying? A good aircraft. But the truth was that there might come a time when it isn't a perfectly good aircraft. A time when it's either jump out of it or crash with it. We needed to know how to do it right, even if we never had to actually do it. They wanted it to prepare us so that we could understand that even if it seemed foolish to jump out of the plane, it might someday be the correct choice, and we needed to know how to do it right. In today's text, Paul is also talking about a, a contrast between what appears foolish and what appears to be wisdom. The foolishness that is the world's wisdom and the God's wisdom that the world sees as being foolish. As I think on it, though, hasn't God repeatedly worked in his, that way in his dealings with us, in a way that appears foolish? Hasn't he repeatedly demonstrated that even when his actions seem foolish to us, they are amazingly right in the big picture? Check out God's plan for the Hebrews and the Israelites as they left Egypt. He had them march out into the desert for two or three days, days and night. And then he had them turn back and enter into a canyon that opened up with the ocean, the sea at its back. And went there until the Egyptian cavalry showed up. Then he had them march out into a dry seabed. Or how about this? Look for the plans for taking Jericho. God's big plan was so to quietly walk around the city saying nothing for six days and on the seventh day they were to blow their horns and yell or how about this one god chose the runt littlest guy in the smallest tribe of israel made him the leader and then pared down his troop from a troops from a army of several thousand down to 300 men to go against an army of 135,000 men well, when it gets even better, rather than swords, that Gideon, who was that, so, that leader, and his men were to use torches in clay pots that they were to, and carry uh, trumpets in their hands. That was their armor. That's what they were supposed to go to war with against this 135,000. And then what he had them do was in the dark, they had to march out there in the dark, smash their pitchers, hold up their their torches and blow their horns. That was the whole plan. Now, doesn't that, that sound brilliant? Are you ready to sign up for that job? I don't think I am. 
Is there any possible rational approach that we can take, that we consider any of those plans as anything but foolish in our own wisdom? Wouldn't we all be tempted to say, well, that's just crazy. But since it seems that God often does things that seem foolish or crazy to us, maybe we shouldn't be surprised that he would come up with the most radically foolish plan of all as a way to save us. He sends his only son to live as a pauper and die in our place so we can live and then tells us to die to ourselves and live for him in order to have eternal life. Talk about speaking in circles and something that hadn't scraped your head. How does that sound reasonable? Is it any wonder that the unsaved will respond, well, that's just crazy. The whole idea is counter-cultural and counterintuitive. which just it just doesn't seem right. It's the opposite of how any rational purpose would expect it to be. In today's text, Paul is trying to explain why that radical plan seems so foolish to the culture that those early Christians lived in, while in reality, it was the best plan of all. In a very real sense, his explanations are the same that would apply to us living in our culture today, right here in 21st century America. You see, this is not a new problem. The message of Paul's to put Paul today for the, our Christians today is simple. Christianity with its message of salvation based upon the death, resurrection of Jesus Christ has always been a puzzle. From the very early church to right now today, it is counter to all our secular culture beliefs. Following God has always been that way. And that's the message. Remember the early Israelites and their torches and their pitchers and their trumpets? Don't you think that sounded foolish to the people of that time? Faith in God and doing things God's way is counter-cultural all the way. Give to receive tenfold. Love your enemies. Blessed are the poor. Die to live. It goes against everything and anything that society believes and follows. Those living for themselves and with the blessing of our society will never in their own wisdom understand it. Nor will they, and they will keep right on saying, well, that's just crazy. You don't, and you, you don't think about it. Isn't that the, what you hear out there when people think, oh, I don't believe in God, that stuff doesn't they're basically, they're saying, that's just crazy. They can't accept it because they're using the worldly wisdom. Belief in God's salvation has always been hard for those wise in the wisdom of the world. The Jews were focused on history as the basis of their wisdom and wanted signs that they could interpret based upon that history that would show that this was the way to go. The ancient Greeks they were really proud of their great philosophers, you know, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. But their pride in all of that had made them almost worship logic itself to the point where it was a god to them. Then God gave them all something really unexpected, a crucified Christ. Now, in reality, Christ, or Messiah, meant to them, all of them, power, splendor, and triumph, because that's the way they read it in the, world, in the world's eyes. Crucified, on the other hand, meant weakness, defeat, death, and humiliation. Christ crucified. It was an oxymoron then, and it was an oxymoron today. For Paul, though, the word of the cross him being crucified, Jesus being crucified, was the gospel. It was the good news of God. And it was impossible for him to preach the gospel without presenting that word of the cross. Did it sound foolish to the society and the intellectuals of that time? Yes, it did. It sounded foolish as the Dickens to 
but he still preached it anyway. And folks, that message is as hard today for those who worship at the altar of education and human rationality to the exclusion of any understanding that can't be arrived at logically. There's a story told about a class Albert Einstein was teaching once. One day the students in that class were saying that they had decided there was no God. Einstein asked them how much of all the knowledge of the world they had amongst themselves collectively as a class. And the students discussed that for a while and decided that they had probably 5% of all human knowledge amongst themselves. Now, Einstein thought that their estimate was a bit, uh, not necessarily liberal, but uh, a little bit large, shall we say. But nevertheless, he, he asked them this. He says, is it possible, then, that God exists in the 95% you don't know? That other 95% is where we find God. That place outside of our own knowledge is that place where faith resides. And that's how we find God. To those who want to stay inside the 5% that we know, then they're just not going to see the knowledge and the that the faith in Christ will give them. They'll just see it as being foolishness. They look at that and they say, well, that's just crazy. It sounds foolish to the intellectuals of today, just as it sounded foolish to the intellectuals back then. And like Paul back then, we must still preach it today. David Guzik, gives this illustration. We preach Christ crucified. A strong church once inscribed these words on an archway leading into the churchyard. Over time, two things happened. The church lost its passion for Jesus and his gospel, and the ivy began to grow on the archway. The growth of the ivy covering the message showed the spiritual decline. Originally, it said strongly, we preach Christ crucified. But as the ivy grew, one could only read, we preach Jesus Christ. And the church also started preaching Jesus the man, Jesus the moral example, Jesus the wonderful teacher, instead of Christ crucified. The ivy kept growing, and one could soon only read, we preach. The church had even lost Jesus in the message, preaching, preaching religious platitude and social graces and social concerns. Finally, one could only re read we. And the church also became just another social gathering place, all about we and us, not God. Folks, as counterculture, as countercultural or counterintuitive as it might be, and foolish as the world around us thinks it is, we must preach the word of God as he gave it to us and not as our own culture. And some modern theologians want to rewrite it so that it satisfies their own wisdom. Just as Paul kept preaching the good news of the Christ crucified to a world who thought it was foolish back then, we must keep preaching Christ crucified as our message to the world today. John 3.16 is as true today as it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus told Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Our sins today are just as ugly as they were when God told Moses what they were and how ugly they were back then. It is just as necessary for us to repent of them today as it was to repent of them back then. For us to tell folks otherwise is quite simply to lie to them to their own and their and our own eternal hurt. Jesus Christ 
died a horrible death on that cross to save us, regardless as to whether someone says, well, that's just crazy. Would you please join in the closing prayer? Father, as we learn from your word, help us to take comfort in the knowledge that it has always seemed foolish to the world that God would send his son to die for us. Help us to show the world how beautiful God's plan really is and that it is the only foolish because they haven't opened their eyes of faith to see the truth that is the cross. And Lord, help us help them see that. Let us be truly one beggar showing another beggar where the food is. Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. And if you'll stand and join in singing How Great They Are, hymn number 77.
Go now in God's blessing and may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. You are dismissed. Jean